The killing of the stair in 1815 marked O'Connell out as the champion of the Irish nation. He had faced down the assassin of the Protestant ascendancy and had shot him dead. He had proven that he could fight as well on the field of battle as he could in the courtroom. And from that moment on, O'Connell's leadership of the Irish nationalist movement was in question, at least in the foreseeable future. O'Connell loved being the chieftain, and in fact, a lot of his financial problems stemmed from that, because he wanted to show that he was the generous Gaelic lord. He would buy meals for the supporters. He would uh, uh, pay for uh, any, anything that they needed, any expenses. He would rent the rooms of the Catholic Association. And that was because he was playing up to the image of being this great Catholic uh, leader, this great Gaelic chieftain. It did mean that his family was horribly in debt and O'Connell was a terrible man for money. If you think about his earnings as a lawyer, by 1828, when he was at the height of his profession, he was earning £8,000 a year. Now that maybe was number 100,000 in, in today's money, an incredible amount of money. But his debts were four times that amount. So that meant that if he died, if he had died in the duel, or if he died of, because of, he's now in his 50s in the 1820s, if he died for any reason, uh, he would have left his family and his children with no income. So there was a recklessness there. And despite all his attempts at cost uh, cutting, for example, in 1823, 24, he sent his wife and his family off to Paris thinking that that would save money and borrowed money off his brother James to do it. But when they came back, they discovered, well, actually, Paris is a very expensive city and they'd gone further into debt. Why was O'Connell so bad with money? Well, the simple reason is that he knew he would inherit a lot of land and money once his uncle hunting cap died. And this was the 19th century. How long could old people live? How long did the old man have left in him? Well, Hunting Cap lived until 1825. He died when he was 97 years old. He died when O'Connell was 50. So all of that time, O'Connell uh, living on the expectation of that uh, was just living recklessly. And even when Hunting Cap finally died in 1825, O'Connell didn't use the inheritance to pay off his debts. He actually borrowed more money so he could renovate Derry Nan, the house that he had inherited in County Kerry, to build an extension, to build great furniture that Lord's Chancellors used to have, so that it would be more of a palace, more of a home befitting a great Irish chieftain. Because image was so important to O'Connell. O'Connell also had a volcanic temper. He insisted that things were done his way or they wouldn't be done at all. The movement split in the, in the late 1810s because O'Connell insisted at doing it one way, even though some of the other leaders like Grattan wanted to do it another way. And even though Grattan was his great hero, he turned on Grattan and said, Grattan is too old. Grattan has lost his way. Grattan no longer speaks for the Irish people. Things had to be done O'Connell's way or they wouldn't be done at all. And very often, O'Connell would get rid of his opponents and then he would change his mind. He would actually adopt the position that they had, but once it was now seen as his position rather than anyone else's. So he was a difficult man to work with. He had very strong views. The problem that O'Connell faced in the early 1820s was that the Catholic movement was apathetic. Less than 10 people would gather for the meetings of the Catholic Association in Dublin. Now, some people look at that and think, well, is that a sign that this wasn't meaningful to people? No, it was because they were so used to having their hopes raised and then crushed. Raised in 1800, crushed in 1801, raised throughout the 1810s by various relief acts, crushed. That people began to think this will never happen. We will never get our rights. We will never win. And because the quorum for the meetings was 10, very often the meetings would be cancelled because there weren't enough people at them. And O'Connell had a great idea to revolutionise the movement, to make it a mass democratic movement. But he found that weeks would go by and he couldn't even propose the idea because there were less than 10 people there. And one time in a meeting, he was getting so frustrated there were only eight people there, O'Connell and seven others. 
And he was so frustrated, he went downstairs to the bookstore. And there were two Catholic priests there. And priests were honorary members of the society. So O'Connell turned to him and he said, I need you upstairs. I need you uh, to come just for the count. And the priest said, no, 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 we're not getting involved in politics. Nothing to do with us. O'Connell didn't take no for an answer. He shoved them upstairs. The vote was taken, 10 people were there. The meeting could continue and the priest drifted away. And it was at that meeting that O'Connell unveiled his great idea which transformed the movement. The penny a month scheme, the Catholic rent. You would use the churches to collect a rent every month outside of the church, a church gate collection. And it would only be a penny per person. Now that wasn't a lot of money. So it meant that men, women, children could all contribute. That transformed the movement. Previously, only the merchants and the elite Catholics were involved. The rest of the people, they were excluded. But now everyone could contribute. Everyone felt part of this movement and the movement grew in strength. The movement grew in numbers. It became a national movement. Now, this was a few months before Andrew Jackson began his great campaign for the presidency in 1824. And, and that's considered the world's first mass democratic movement. Well, you have O'Connell overlapping him there in this great democratic movement. And it got to 1828 and O'Connell hit upon a great idea. He said, I'm going to stand the next time there's an election, no matter where it is, because the rules stop a Catholic taking the seat. You can't take your seat without swearing all of these oaths that denounce the Catholic faith that are an insult to the Irish people. But there's nothing to stop you running. And in 1828, a by-election was called in County Clare because the sitting MP, William V.C. Fitzgerald, who was a liberal landlord, his father was a man who had been sacked for opposing the union, but he was someone who, even though he supported emancipation, supported the government of Wellington and Peel that opposed emancipation, and the Catholic Association had decided they must be opposed in every election. O'Connell decided he would stand, and he announced his candidacy, and the country went wild. And when O'Connell set out in his carriage, to travel down to Clare. People came out of their houses to get a look at him, to touch the carriage as it went by. When it arrived in Tipperary, they tried to unhitch the horses from the carriage so that the people could drag the carriage themselves, pull it into the town. Bands came to sing him on their way. People cheered him all along. Bonfires were lit to telegraph his passing. This was the Irish champion taking on the British ascendancy to win Catholic emancipation. Now, elections in Ireland in the 19th century were famous for two things, and they were connected. They were famous for drinking, and they were famous for fighting. And O'Connell, before he left Dublin, sent down the order. There was to be no drinking of any alcohol for the three weeks of the campaign. Anyone who was to be found drunk would be thrown in the river. There was to be no violence. If someone tried to provoke you, you could not respond. And that order went down and the people followed it. Because 3,000 British soldiers had also been sent down to Clare. And they had been sent down with instructions to open fire at the first sign of trouble, to massacre the people. But they couldn't do anything now because nobody was drinking, nobody was fighting. They tried to provoke the people by getting some of their supporters to run up and punch someone in the head. And when the Irish would be about to respond, someone would shout, no, remember the order. And they would remember O'Connell's instruction and they backed down. The order that O'Connell sent terrified the British government more than anything else. Because he gave the word there was to be no drinking and there was no drinking. He gave the word there was to be no fighting, and there was no fighting. Robert Peel, the Home Secretary, said that British power in Ireland had been shivered to atoms. Wellington, the Prime Minister, looked to the King and he said, I defeated Napoleon at Waterloo. I could defeat the Irish if they rose up in a rebellion. We just send in our cannon, our infantrymen, like in 1798. We'd blow them to bits but I can't defeat this. We can't defeat a peaceful protest. We can't defeat a people 
that won't fight. O'Connell showed that he gave the word and the people followed. And he stood for election in County Clare. And he had to announce his candidacy at the hustings. And various speeches were given. And uh, the person who was proposing, William V.C. Fitzgerald, got up and he said, O'Connell is selfish. O'Connell is only doing this because he wants emancipation so he can become a king's counsel and he'll earn a thousand pounds extra a year. He's doing this for the money. And O'Connell stood up and he said, the man who has made that allegation, Francis Gore, became a lawyer the exact same year as me, 1798. Now since then, I've gone on to have a great career. He's gone on to have no career. Now what stopped him? Lack of intelligence, lack of talent. What stopped me from rising any further? My religion. So am I to be subjected to the taunts of a briefless barrister, a bigot without business? And that shut up Gore. Then William V.C. Fitzgerald got up to speak. Now he was a popular landlord, don't forget. The people liked him, even though he was a supporter of the Peel-Wellington government. And he spoke about how the O'Connell team had made allegations about him. They'd accused him of embezzling a hundred thousand pounds of government money. And he said, that's not fair, that's not fair. And then he talked about his father, James Fitzgerald, the prime sergeant who had opposed the union in 1800. And he said, my father is on his deathbed and it would kill him instantly if he knew I was being opposed. And then he broke down in tears. And he said, oh, I apologize, I'm crying, I'm sorry. And the crowd, being emotional, they broke down in tears as well. And everyone was crying. He goes, no, no, I'm sorry. And so when he went to sit down, they were cheering him and applauding him. They loved him again. O'Connell was next. What could he do? If he said V.C. Fitzgerald was a great man, well then why shouldn't they vote for him and not for O'Connell? If he attacked V.C. Fitzgerald, then he risked alienating the crowd. So O'Connell did what he always did, a bit of misdirection. He began with a joke. He talked about how they had accused V.C. Fitzgerald of embezzling £100,000. And he says, ah, you know what? He's probably right. It probably wasn't that. It was probably only £20,000. And then he went on, after telling a few more jokes, he went on to address the charge that he was doing this for selfish reasons, because he would get more money. And he said, well, you know what? I have suffered because of the penal restrictions against my people. Because I only work in the morning and early afternoons as a lawyer. The rest of the day, I work for emancipation. I work for you. If I gave up on this campaign and just dedicated my life to being a lawyer, I could be earning twice as much money because I'd have twice as much time to go to the law courts, but I don't. Because this is meaningful for me, because I'm fighting for all of us here, for our rights, for our freedom. And he said, I have made sacrifices. I have used my own money to pay for rooms, to pay for events, to pay for this movement. I have made sacrifices. And there are times when I go home to my house and I go inside and I think about what I've cost my wife and my children, the sacrifices that we have made, the things that I have not been able to buy them, the things that they have had to go without, the things that I have cost them. And it does make me cry. But I shed my tears in private, for I do not cry in public. And with that, there was a hush. And everyone lost their support for V.C. Fitzgerald, the crybaby who had broken down in public. And they began cheering everything O'Connell was saying. And V.C. Fitzgerald just put his head in his hands and he said, where is this to end? Where is this to end? And O'Connell Polling went on three days. O'Connell won a stunning victory. There was one time when a landlord raised his tenants to come in and order them, you must vote, you must vote for uh, V.C. Fitzgerald. And when they arrived in, a priest, Father Gagan, he stood up and he said, you must not do this. And the tenants all changed their mind and they voted for O'Connell. And O'Connell had a hotel window just opposite the polling booth. Sometimes he would come out and look at them. And when they saw O'Connell, they realised in their hearts, 
This was the moment that they could show that they deserved to be free. This was the moment that they could show that they were not slaves. And they voted for O'Connell. And Daniel O'Connell was elected the MP for County Clare.